Take your Bible and look with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 4. 2 Kings, chapter number 4, and let's stand together. Begin reading with me, if you will, in verse number 18. <clears throat> we already know uh, an awful lot about this Shunammite woman. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> we could very easily do a four or five part mini series just on her life. And uh, so today we're going to be looking uh, at this passage with a thought in mind Is it well? Is it well? Verse 18, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him. And went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. <clears throat> so she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi's servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. I'll stop there and uh, we'll pick it up in just a few minutes. With that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Father, all morning long we have sensed your presence. Regardless of whether we sensed your presence or not, we know that you are here because you said you would be. We welcome you. I pray you would x-ray the hearts and the lives of every one of us that are in this room bring to our understanding whether it is well with us or whether it is not. I pray that you would get glory through the preaching of your word. May it find a lodging place in all of our hearts and our minds, enlightening us more to who you are so that we could become more like you and know you even deeper. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and our soon coming king. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now the Bible tells us in some earlier verses that this Shunammite woman was a great woman. Uh, great in that she probably had some means. She had wealth. Uh, she obviously had uh, lots of influence. And she had a great respect for uh, an admiration for the man of God. Elisha had been preaching in and around that area to the point that uh, they got to know him and they invited him uh, to their house for a meal and he enjoyed that meal. Uh, they had it time and again as he would traverse that area preaching and teaching the gospel. One day she goes to her husband and says, Honey, uh, I perceive that Elisha is a holy man of God. And uh, I would like for us to build a room on the side of our house. And in that room, I, I want us to put a bed and uh, maybe an end table with a lamp on it and maybe a little desk over there in the corner that he could use from time to time as he is seeking to rest and maybe just spend time with the Lord, a place that he could call his own. And so they did. This woman was a major blessing to Elisha, the man of God. But Elisha, the man of God, was also a blessing to her. He said to Gehazi, Gehazi, she's been such a great blessing. What can we do for her? 
And uh, she gave a strange answer. She said, I'm doing fine. I, I really don't need anything. But Gehazi had some spiritual depth about him and uh, saw some needs that were there. And he came to Elisha and he said, I'll tell you what we can do. She's married to an older guy who is beyond childbearing age. And they don't have any children. Elisha goes to the Shunammite woman and he says to her, uh, ma'am, in about this season of next year, you're going to have a little boy. God has revealed that to me. And she said, Elisha, please don't uh, kid me about such a sensitive issue. Uh, th this is such a touchy thing for me. And he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm not doing that at all. I'm just telling you, just wait and see. You're going to have a little boy. And the Bible says that just as Elisha had prophesied, it came about that she had a little boy. Now, I don't know how much time has gone on from verse 17 to verse 18. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the Bible says that he was grown. That doesn't mean that he was full grown by any means. And the context of the passage tells us uh, that he was just a little boy. Uh, he was sent out by his mother to the field where his daddy and the reapers were. Didn't say that he was going to go reap. He just wanted to go watch while he was there. And the Bible says that uh, sometime that morning out there in the field, his head started hurting. And uh, he said to his daddy, my, my head, my head. And uh, his daddy turns to what the Bible says is a lad. Now, again, <clears throat> This lad was not full grown, nor was he an infant. But he says to the lad, take, uh, take this boy to his mother. Obviously, he's a little bit older, got a little bit more responsibility. And so he takes this little boy to his mother. And the Bible says he puts her on the mother's lap. Another indication that he is not full grown, but still just an infant boy. And then at about noon... The Bible says the boy died. The Bible then says that this mother took this little boy up in her arms. He couldn't have been too big. And he, she carried him and laid him on the bed of the man of God. So we really don't know how much time from verse 17 to verse 18 that there is. Certainly he is not an adult. He's an infant. He's just a uh, little boy. Now, that brings me to the first point of the message that um, I approach this morning with great fear and trepidation because I know that it's going to open up some old wounds for many that are, might be here this morning. But the fact of the matter is, if I'm going to be true to the text, uh, this subject cannot be avoided. Let me give you point number one. As I look into this passage, one of the things that I see is the greatest heartache of any parent. The greatest heartache of any parent. Look at verse 20, if you will. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. I don't know of any greater heartache that a dad or a mom could ever experience than the death of their son or their daughter. It's probably the most difficult process of life that anyone will ever go through. Now, all of us anticipate in our life that we are going to, at one point in time, we're going to have to bury our dad, we're going to have to bury our mother, but we don't ever think about and anticipate the fact that we might have to bury our children. It's not normal, it's abnormal. It's not a part of the progression of life itself. It is a sad time, it is a fraternity that no one wants to belong to the fraternity of surviving parents. I guess the only good thing that you could say that could ever come out of that would be 
that if parents had to go through that experience where they buried their son or their daughter, somewhere down the line they would come across another set of parents going through the same thing that the encouragement that they had received from the Lord they could share with that couple. There's some here today that know a whole lot better than me of what it means to belong to that fraternity. The second lesson that I see here this morning is uh, the greatest lesson we can learn about death and life. Let, let me share some of those about death if I can. What, what, what does this passage tell us uh, about death? First of all, death can come suddenly and unexpectedly. At morning time, this little boy comes running out of his house, runs down to the field where his dad and the reapers were working, and he's kicking up the dirt along the way, and he's frolicking there uh, around, but by noontime, he's dead. Now there's no way of anticipating those turn of events. He's out in the field. He's having the time of his life. All of a sudden, he grabs his head for what unknown reason. It could have been a stroke. It could have been an aneurysm. It could have been a blood clot. We don't know. It would be speculative. But he grabs his head and he cries out to his daddy. And something happened that this little boy's mom and dad were not prepared for. Sometimes death comes unexpectedly, not always. Sometimes death comes expectedly. You know, someone may be experiencing uh, the horrors of cancer and that cancer lingers in their body and we can anticipate uh, as a result of the deterioration of the body that that loved one of ours is just not going to make it. And in some sense of the word, we might get to a point that we might be a little bit prepared, but there are some times that death can come extremely unexpectedly. Yesterday morning, the second of the strongest prayer warriors that I have ever had surrounding my life woke up from sleep, got up out of his chair, took about three steps and collapsed at his wife's feet and was in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes death comes unexpectedly. Number two, death is no respecter of persons. We, we know that uh, death is going to come to the elderly. We have a sense of expectation and anticipation about that, but uh, death also is no respecter of the young. If you were to walk out the doors to my right over here and out into the exterior doors, out into the cemetery, you're going to find an enormous amount of short graves out there as well as the normal size graves. Matter of fact, I've been in some cemeteries where there were as many short graves as there were normal size graves. You, you understand this, that death is not a respecter of persons. Death is not impressed by whether we are young or rich or whether we uh, are uh, red or yellow or black or white or male or female. It could come anyone at any time and sometimes very suddenly and very swiftly in a split second. Death is no respecter of persons. Uh, the, the next lesson of death that I see in this is all of the love of the loved ones cannot stop death when it comes. This dad surely loved his son. He had no way of knowing when his son grabbed his head that day that his son was about to die. 
Uh, he loved him with all of his heart. This mom had absolutely no suspicions whatsoever that her son was about to die, nor did she have any idea of the seriousness of his conditions. If a mother's love could have stopped death that day, surely that boy would have never died. All of the love of a loved one cannot stop death's march. If it could, all here whose love could have stopped the death of your mom or your dad or your husband or your wife, you know that you would have if you could have. If you could have, you wouldn't be going home today to an empty house. Death cannot be stopped by all of the love of our loved ones. The, the fourth thing I see here in this text uh, uh, about death is that sometimes death is unexplainable. I am asked periodically the question, why? Why? Some ask me, Pastor, is it wrong to question why? My response is no, it is not wrong for you to question why, but God is under no obligation whatsoever to answer that question. It's not wrong. Sometimes you can explain death. Well, they had a disease. They were sick for a very long time. They spent uh, many days in ICU and they uh, ingested all of the medicine that our professions could uh, give them. They, they, they had all of the best treatment that is humanly possible. They were hooked up to the best machinery that technology could provide and nothing worked. So you could explain it at that point as the death is just simply a part of life. But it, when it comes to a lad, to a little boy who is kicking up clods of dirt in the morning time and by noon is dead, there is no answer to the question of why. Many people have asked me that question, why? And the fact of the matter is, I have never had the answer to that question. Sometimes when I know the answer, they never ask me. But when they ask me, I never have the answer. Sometimes people ask me, Pastor, is God punishing me? Probably not. Um, God, if there was an issue, God would most likely go to the source. Uh, he would not get at you through your kids. I'm telling you what, when um, in the past, when uh, God wants to get at me, he knows my address. Sometimes he may, but not normally. He did in Pharaoh's household, if you will remember. Sometimes death is just unexplainable. It's unexplainable to me that a teenager who loves God with all of his heart and soul and being riding down the road in his car is suddenly T-boned by a drunk driver and his life is taken. I don't have the answer to the question of why. It's unexplainable. Some time ago, I had a 15-year-old dying from cancer. Said, Pastor, um, I'm not going to make it through this treatment this time. I've made it through a lot before, but I'm not going to make it through this time. And um, I got some things I want you to say at my funeral went on to share his burden for his friends who did not know Jesus. He said, but I don't want you to say anything to anybody. I said, okay. I carried that around for months. And on my way out to preach his memorial service, I broke under the load that I had carried because I could not answer the question. Why? 
there are some unknowables in this life. There are some deaths that are unexplainable. Number five, what I see here is uh, we can be prepared for it. I don't know this for sure. I believe that I'm accurate, but I'm not positive. It may have been Mosey Lister who wrote a song. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. When I come to the end of life's way, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That we don't have to cross over death's chilly river by ourselves. Isn't it wonderful to know that when we die, we can die in the very arms of Christ. Isn't it a glorious thought that when death overtakes us, we can die in Christ. Now all of us are going to die. Uh, unless Jesus comes and takes us home in the rapture, we have an appointment with death. You can change your hair appointment. You can change your dentist appointment. You can change the appointment to have your car worked on. But ladies and gentlemen, you can't change the appointment with the undertaker. It's fixed. Long before you were ever born, there's a day. It's out there. And you can't reschedule. But you can be prepared for it. Amos thundered out, prepare to meet your God. You can prepare. Now the truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, we're all going to meet Jesus whether we are prepared or whether we're not. Now I want to talk to you about some lessons about life that arise out of this passage. First of all, life is very short Psalm chapter 90, the psalmist says, life is like the grass that appears for a little while and then it withers. It's like the flowers that spring up in the morning, but by the end of the day, they are dead. Uh, James said that life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We are in the midst of one of these cold spells and you don't have to go out very long until you make a little puff of uh, uh, air that comes out your mouth and you see the vapor that is there. It appears for just a minute, but then, boom, it is gone. Life is extremely short. The second lesson about life is this. Uh, 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 the, 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 we better love our loved ones while we have the opportunity, for once that opportunity comes and goes, we will never be able to get it again. There will be a time we can't. In my adolescence, I was forced to go with my family to what is called decoration. Over in East Tennessee, over in the mountains of Western North Carolina, decoration is when you go over to the cemetery to visit your loved ones who are already in the ground and you carry some flowers and you go over and clean up the grave and you put some flowers there at the graveside and then we would have some preacher. He would stand and preach and there would be some music and we'd just spend time with the loved ones that have gone on before us. And I thought that was the silliest thing in the world. I would think to myself, dead noses smell no red roses. Well, why are we up here? You know, but I'll tell you this, listen, you don't criticize decoration in Western North Carolina. You don't criticize decoration in East Tennessee. That's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. But the fact of the matter is, dead folks can't hear what you have to say. And they can't see what you are doing. And you better tell your loved ones you love them now. A young man was tragically killed in our neighborhood many years ago. I went to the hospital with that daddy. He stretched himself out over his son's body. 
And he said to his son, oh, son, come back just for a minute or two. He screams aloud. You could hear him all over the hospital. I never told you I loved you. Come back. You knew I loved you, but I never told you. Let me tell you, just one time. If I had just 24 hours for living, the things that don't matter could wait. I would play with the children. I'd hear all of their stories. I'd tell you I love you before it's too late. You better tell them while you have the time. The, the, the next lesson I see about life is that you ought to live every day to the fullest. The Bible says that every day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is a day to the Lord. And if we were to live 70 years, it's just boom, been here for a moment and then it is over. You ought to live your life to the capacity. Of, you know what I do every day of my life? I, I don't remember a day that has gone by in these recent years that I, I haven't thought to myself, you know what? I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. I'm going to enjoy today. Jesus may come today or he may call me home today and I'm going to reach my maximum today. You may be here for 30 more years. I, I won't be for 30 more years. You might be. Some will make it, some won't, including me. But there's a day fixed. You may live life to the fullest every day. Now let me give you this. The greatest sorrow a parent can know, the greatest lessons about life and death. Let me give you the greatest source of comfort in time of sorrow. Hear me a minute, hear me, listen, listen, look this way, look this way. May I say to you here this morning, every one of you, comfort is never going to be found in a bottle or in a pill. Just settle it. So what is the greatest source of our comfort? The greatest source of our comfort is our faith. Our, our faith in times of sorrow, in times of Heartache. Watch what happens here. I, I, I'm telling you, it's one of the strangest. You, you've heard me say this, haven't you? And, and, and maybe others. I don't know how people make it through these life experiences without the Lord. You know, you, you, you heard me say that? I, I say it periodically. And what we're really saying is this. The only way that I am making it through this experience is my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now, now watch this in verse 21. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Don't you find that strange? I, I, I'm going to tell you what she wasn't doing. She didn't pick up the phone and call Good Shepherd and say, hey, we need to make some funeral arrangements. She wasn't making a list of who the pallbearers were going to be or in order of service or picking out the songs that are gonna be sung at the funeral. She took that baby boy up to the bed of the man of God and laid him down saying in her heart, God, you gave me this little boy miraculously. You gave him to me when it was all hopeless and helpless. You supernaturally granted this grace gift to my life. And now, Lord, I know in my heart that you've got something that you're about to do to invade the circumstances of my life. And I believe you're going to raise him up, put him in on the man of God's bed. What, what, what faith that she had. She, she, her faith is evidenced again in verse 23. And he said, wherefore will you go to him today? It's neither new moon or Sabbath. And she said, it's all going to be okay. Elisha, her husband, Elisha's not preaching today. He's not down at the synagogue. It's not a holy day of worship. It's not the Sabbath. He's nowhere around here. She goes back and she said, yeah, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Now, now listen to this. Listen. Real faith just doesn't work when things are going well. 
Real faith affirms that it is well when things are not going well. Most of us uh, don't have to call on our faith during the good times. But the fact of the matter is, we learn a whole lot more about God in the valley than we ever did on the mountain. We learn a whole lot more about God in the shadows than we do in the sunshine. We learn a whole lot more about God in the darkness than we do in the daylight. Her, her faith, that's what faith is all about. Then another great source is your family. Another great source of comfort is your family. When my dad died, he died on a very, very cold weekend, very much like uh, what we have now, except there was a lot of snow and a lot of ice. And, and you know what? Dad's friends couldn't get uh, to us. Our friends couldn't get to us necessarily. And, 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 and you know, one of the things that we, we drew from was we helped each other as a family get through those eventful days in our life. You know, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that just don't have family like that around them. I've watched family come together when, when they were disjointed and fragmented and torn apart. I've watched tragedy strike and I've watched God take that tragedy and mend the hearts of those family members. Family is a great source. She, she said to her husband, honey, I got to go take care of some things. I got to go manage some things. Everything's going to be okay. She turned to her family. Another source of comfort is the people of God. She says, I'm going to find Elisha. I'm going to go find the man of God. Now, don't pigeonhole this scenario into just saying that the source of comfort is only going to be found in the preacher. That's not what he's talking about here in this passage at all. He's talking about, in general, the people of God. Like your, I woke up this morning and reached over and cut the alarm off on my phone and I noticed that I had a couple of unread emails and, and so uh, I, I opened up one of the emails and it was from one of our new members who joined back in uh, the fall and uh, her loved one had died and she wrote this whole big email about how her life group and how various staff members and different people out of the congregation had ministered to her for months on end before her parent had died and then days after her parent had died, how they rallied around her and not one time did she mention the preacher. In other words, she was bragging, this is how church ought to be, that we draw from the people of God for our comfort. Thank God for you life groups. Thank God for the staff. Thank God for the leadership of this fellowship. It's amazing to me that we can find great comfort within the body of Christ. By the way, I'll just say this. You're not gonna find comfort from those who don't know Jesus. They can't identify. The Bible identifies them as others which have no hope. And you can't draw hope from hopeless people. You all right with that? All right, let me give you now the greatest question you will ever face. The greatest question you'll ever face. Honey, get me a servant and a buggy and a horse and I'm gonna go chase the down the man of God. She got on some kind of animal. The servant led her from Shunem to Mount Carmel. I looked, and best case scenario, it's about a 20 mile trip. Now, I don't know whether she made it all in one day or not. I, I don't, that round trip, I have no idea. The scripture doesn't tell us, but she made that 20 mile trip till she found the preacher on Mount Carmel. He's up there, he looks, and he said, Gehazi, look yonder, look yonder. There's that Shunammite woman. Run now, run, run, ask her. 
Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Daniel opened up, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet me, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul and Lord. Haste the day when my faith shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back like a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Is it well with you? Such a personal question. Such a personal question. But let, let me say to you this morning, it is not well with you if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is not well with you if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. It, it is not well with you if the blood of Jesus has not covered your sin. But it's a missionary question too. Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Is it well with the people that are around you? All of us, every one of us in this room have a keen awareness of the people that are in our family, the people that we work with, the people that are in our neighborhoods, the people that we come across on a daily basis. We have an awareness that it's not well with them. It's a missionary question. Is it well with the people around you? Found out something. There's something worse that parents go through than the death of a child. It's when parents go through the death of a child who doesn't know Jesus. I was in a home once and I helped them make the funeral arrangements for their child. I was getting ready to pray. And as I began my prayer, mama came up and put her hands on my shoulders and she yelled in my ear, preacher, pray for my boy. My boy's in hell, preacher. I never took him to church. I never read him the Bible. I never let him go to vacation Bible school. Preacher, my boy's in hell. Pray my boy out of hell, preacher. Pray my boy out of hell. I'll never ever forget those words. There's a time that it's too late to pray. Is it well with you? Is it well with the people that are around you? 